Hello everyone, I am the Comics Kid 2099 and I am joined today by my co-host Connor Nielsen. We are the Podcast Boys and for the last few weeks we have been talking about episodes of Twin Peaks The Return. Also, I've been calling it Twin Peaks Season 3 and uh, today Connor is going to tell us a little bit about Episode 6, I believe. Uh, Connor, what happened in this episode? I'm going to start with probably the biggest bit of news. We catch up with Albert and he is driving in what looks to me like Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. and he walks into a bar, and he meets Diane. At the end of part four, they were having a questioning whether or not Evil Coop was the real Coop, and they wanted to be sure, and Albert and uh, Gordon knew if there was one person on planet Earth who would uh, know the difference, they would get her, and uh, they knew what she drank, and it turns out it is Diane played none other than Laura Dern. This gets me excited in so many different ways, but we don't ever actually hear her say anything other than Albert as an acknowledgement of her, him calling her name out. Also happening, we uh, catch up with the character played by Harry Dean Stanton from Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. He has apparently opened the new Fat tra Trailer Park, and it's not outside Deer Meadow. I guess it's outside Twin Peaks now. And... He goes into town, and uh, he sees a mother and a son playing, and then I'm going to put a pin in that because I'm going to backtrack. And the guy who has been assaulting women and, I guess, running drugs through the roadhouse in the last episode, who looks a lot like Mac Matthew McConaughey, uh, that guy, I know that character's name. I don't want to say it in case you don't know it because I don't want it to be like you get spoiled or anything, uh, but... He has been meeting up with that one guy from the end of part two who was in the roadhouse that was, like, waving at Shelly, who Shelly kind of gave the cold shoulder. And he does these weird magic things with a dime, and it totally freaks out uh, this Matthew McConaughey-looking character. And he gets angry and freaked out by it, and he's, like, driving like a crazy person. And then, putting a pin in that, we also jump back to the double R, where we catch up with uh, Heidi, who's still snickering all about, uh, with one of their customers who loves their coffee and loves their pie. And... Uh, Shelly's also there. This character leaves, and these last three things I've kind of been talking about all converge, where Harry Dean Stanton, who looks very old, he's 90 years old when they shot these scenes, uh, he uh, sees a mother and a son uh, kind of playing a game, and then the Matthew McConaughey-looking character, see, uh, he doesn't want to stop at a stop sign, so he decides to just run through, uh, you know, getting into the other lane, and then the mother and the son, well, the son is crossing the street at the exact same time, and he hits the kid, going extremely fast. And then Harry Dean Stanton sees the life leave the child as it goes up in the sky. And also the woman who loves the coffee and uh, pie at the double R sees this all happen. So we know we're in Twin Peaks. Um, <sighs> meanwhile, uh, in the ongoing misadventures of Dougie Jones, we have uh, Naomi Watts, Oh my goodness, Dougie, I totally forgot. Where's your car? She also finds out about Dougie's affair with Jade, the escort, uh, who in the last episode returned the key to a P.O. box. Then uh, we also get him opening up some case files and doodling around drawing st uh, stairs and ladders and lines connecting stuff. He also catches up with his son named Sonny Jim, which is the weirdest name for a kid ever. Um, but then Naomi Watts is just not having any of it because she finds out about the affair. She knows about his uh, his debt to somebody else for $52,000. And so she sets up the meeting while Dougie does some case file work. And he sees little specks of light appearing. And that's what causes him to draw on these files. And the next day at work, uh, he goes on in and shows the his boss those case files. And he says, how am I supposed to make... Uh, how am I supposed to make sense of this? To which Dougie just says, make sense of this which I thought was a pretty clever line of dialogue. And Tom Sizemore in the other room, who Dougie called a liar last episode, is obviously nervous about something. And then in the other room, the bo Dougie's boss is like, whoa, you're right. You, you were on to something. Uh, thank you very much for all of your, your, all of your work. And then Dougie kind of obliviously just sort of goes, okay, and then leaves. Um, also, Naomi Watts meets up with uh, the people that Dougie is in debt to. One of them just happens to be Faraday from Lost. 
and she says, I ain't given you $52,000. Here's $25,000 because the original debt was $20,000 and over three weeks it accrued interest to 52. So she says, I ain't doing that. I'm a poor person. I'm giving you all this money. And then they say, oh, okay, tough dame. And then it's at a park. Also happening, remember in Las Vegas where um, – in the first episode, the first or second episode, where that one guy who's in an office and his like assistant's with Danny Rand, and uh, the black guy, he's off the computer, and he said something in the first episode that was, don't let anyone like him in your life ever. Well, a red square appears on his monitor, and he goes to the safe and pulls out a file, and later, there's a, a short person uh, who is sitting at a desk in an apartment, and then a file slips under his door and he opens it up and it is a picture of the woman who was on the phone to the hitman from last episode and dougie jones and he has an ice pick and he hits the two pictures later in the episode he shows up and murders uh the woman and anyone else in that office may have seen him uh and but also his ice pick has been damaged so uh it's left to assume that he might be attacking dougie jones next episode um also happening in this episode we have uh oh at the uh, sheriff's department hawk is in the bathroom and he drops a coin and the coin goes underneath the bathroom stall he's in the bathroom stall he looks out the coin and it has a native american chief on it and then he looks behind him in the stall and he notices that the door of the bathroom stall was made by something called nez purse manufacturing and this catches his eye because i guess uh, hawk's heritage is nez purse and he notices that at the top of this place, there are screws missing, and he thinks that there must be something behind, inside the stall door. So he goes and grabs a crowbar, pries it open. That really obnoxious uh, cop, Chip, he comes on in, uh, and he's like, hey, I need to use the restroom. And he says, hey, find another restroom. I'm, I'm working. And inside of the, um, the door, he finds some papers. We don't know what the papers are, but he walks off with them. Uh, also in this episode, we find out that uh, Frank Truman and his wife are on such rocky terms because their son committed suicide, and that's what's kind of led them to their, uh, what's led to her hysteria and his uh, somewhat uh, contemptment for the world. Because he's, he's sort of had this um, weight on him that he just doesn't like his life, and I've kind of picked up on that, and I guess that's the reason. Uh, Chip doesn't care. He says, who cares? Your son couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't handle being a soldier, wah, wah, and everyone just sort of like gives him the cold shoulder and says, well, you're a jerk. Um, and then I guess there's another thing that happens right after this, I want to say, right? Um, I see. You talked about Albert meeting Diane. You talked about Hawk finding the papers. Um, I don't think there's anything else. Um, I, I think you've covered everything. If I remember it, I'll let you know, but I think that's about everything that happened in this episode. All right, yeah. I, uh, I took some notes, and I was reading off of those notes, and, uh, maybe I missed a scene or two, but that's the general gist. We don't ever go back to Buenos Aires. Uh, maybe we do. The little guy straight up murders a lot of people yeah that uh, might have been in buenos aires because i yeah. think that lady was in argentina wasn't she yeah i so. think so uh comics kid what did you think of this episode okay so this episode is not much different from some of the last episodes but i liked it just a tiny bit more um I'll, i've still got a lot of issues with this series uh, i still don't like that they are continuing to introduce new elements and subplots uh this far into the season i feel like it, this far in they should be taking these things and, like, having them converge. Like, I really like that scene where Harry Dean Stanton sees the kid uh, get run over and that woman who is in the double R, uh, she sees the kid get run over. I like that because it's three separate things all converging into one separate thing. I just wish that all of these other 400 subplots would do the same thing by this point. Um, but uh, I like that scene with Harry Dean, Harry Dean Stanton also because... That's a character who I know just a little bit about. Uh, you know, last week you were saying that you really liked the scene with Amanda Seyfried where she does the cocaine and she's looking up in the sky and, like, the sun's shining on her face. And to me, that scene meant nothing because I don't know anything about that character and the show hasn't really given me a reason to care about her. But I like the scene with Harry Dean Stanton because in this episode we find out basically he does not enjoy his life. Uh, all he has is his mobile home business and he's, you know, been doing this for a really long time. He says he's been smoking for 75 years uh, every day and he just seems really down in the dumps, but then he sees this woman playing with her kid, and he kind of has this hint of a smile, and it's like, okay, he's really 
crusty person, you know, just uh, doesn't enjoy anything. But then he sees this one little speck of light in his life, and he likes that. And then the kid gets run over, and, like, he sees the light go up. I don't think anyone else does. Um, and to me, I, I really like that. Uh, we knew just a little bit about this guy from Fire Walk With Me. He seemed just as crusty then as he does now. Um, I really like that he is seeing this, and for a split second, he sees a little bit of good in the world, and then he sees it uh, extinguished. Uh, I thought that was a really good scene. Um, other than that, let's see. I did not like the Diane reveal, um, mostly because I, I don't really have any strong opinions on Laura Dern. I know you like her more than I do. Uh, all I know her as is the woman from the Jurassic Park movie, and I haven't seen that movie in over 10 years. Um, but I didn't ever have to actually see Diane. Uh, I was perfectly fine with her just being this maybe she exists, maybe she doesn't person that Cooper talked to on his uh, recording device. I didn't ever have to see her, uh, so that wasn't something that like made me excited like it did other people probably. Um, I, I like that we're finally getting just a tiny bit of momentum on the Hawk subplot uh, where he's looking for something that's connected to his heritage. Um, uh, I'm still getting tired of Dougie. Uh, I really am getting sick of him and everything around him. Like, his wife, Naomi Watts' character, has got to be the biggest idiot in the entire universe because her husband is acting like an infant, like actually acting like an infant. Like, he doesn't know how to walk. He doesn't know how to pee by himself. But then she's telling him that he needs to call these people that he owes $25,000 to, and she expects that he's actually going to do that. Like, that's really strange to me that she still hasn't caught on to the fact that he is, like, extremely disturbed in the head and that he doesn't know how to do anything. And she's just like, oh, he's just my no-good husband, and I'm going to yell at him for all this stuff. Like, I really would have thought that, like, three episodes ago, she would have caught on to the fact that he needs to go to the doctor, and she would have taken him to the doctor. Um, that, that was a little weird, and I'm just getting tired of that subplot, and I'd really like for that to go somewhere. Um, other than that, I don't have a whole lot to say. Oh, you're breaking my heart. This episode is great. This is the best episode of the show so far, I think, by some distance. Um... Oh, I forgot a little detail. Uh, Philip Gerard, the one-armed man in the uh, Red Room, he comes in a vision to Dougie and says, uh, wake up, don't die, don't die, don't die, and then disappears. This also connects to another vision Dougie had. I want to say he was in an apartment, um, and the one-armed man said something to him. Uh, was it uh, right when uh, Cooper's spirit replaced Dougie? Um, yeah. In that uh, in the uh, Rancho Rancho uh, yeah. housing complex? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and we oh, got, yeah, yeah oh, we got a little bit of that. I forgot about that. Yeah, not yeah, much happened uh, the, there. Just the police doing their thing. That woman is screaming one one nine again. Uh, do you think that's going to have anything to do with anything? I, I, I'm not sure if it is. I think it's just weirdness for the sake of weirdness. That the one one nine. I oh, here's the thing though, because the the police showed up to investigate like the bombing, right? Mm -hmm. Or like the the car bomb. Uh. And the license plate's on top of her roof, and she starts screaming one one nine one one nine, and I'm thinking, okay, nine one one is one one nine backwards, right? right? Yeah. In the red room, everyone kind of talks in this weird reverse speak. Hmm. Is this in any way connected? Because it has to be, because we, we've gone back to this place so many different times. Um, okay, where do I begin? Um, the Diane reveal is everything I wanted it to be, because I love it. And I'll tell you why I love it. Not only because I love Laura Dern, I think she is maybe probably my favorite actress uh, right now, anyways. Uh, she and David Lynch have collaborated a lot. I don't know if you're aware of this. They first collaborated for Blue Velvet, where Kyle MacLachlan played the main character. But uh, she is the female lead in that. Uh, that role was originally supposed to go to Molly Ringwald, but Molly Ringwald was like still like 18 when she was uh, at, in 85 or 86 when they shot that film. And... So her parents read the script and said, you're not going to be in that. That'll taint your image. And so they got Laura Dern instead. And then his next film was Wild at Heart, which, once again, she played the female lead against uh, Nicolas Cage, who played the male lead. And then I don't think they collaborated after that until Inland Empire, which was David Lynch's very last film, um, which was made in 2006, where she was the main character. Um, and it's a three-hour film. And... I have also seen her uh, earlier this year. She was in a film called Wilson, which was an indie movie based off of a David Klaus uh, graphic novel that was um, where she played uh, Woody Harrelson's uh, ex-wife. And I thought she was fabulous in that. I really like Laura Dern. I think she's one of our best actresses working. And her playing Diane means something. At least it means something to me. And it means something, I think, important to film history. There were a variety of... Um, uh, 
covers of Variety magazine going around that were, you know, building up Twin Peaks. Now, did you see these covers? Uh, I don't think so. It's Kyle MacLachlan with his Agent Cooper hairdo, but he's wearing a black T-shirt. And Laura Dern is sitting in the passenger side of the car with him. And David Lynch is in the back seat. Uh, there is – the thing about uh, Blue Velvet is that movie was, you know, touted up as a masterpiece when it came out. And a lot it was very polarizing. A lot of people didn't like it. But over time, a lot of people turned around on it. And um, a lot of people at the end of the decade said it was one of the best films of the 80s. And it has gone down as one of the most important American films from the 20th century. And uh, there are lots of scenes of Kyle MacLachlan and Laura Dern sitting in a car talking about what they think is happening in this little mystery they're investigating. There's a lot of that in that movie. And those scenes have cinematic history and weight to them. So now that it's revealed that uh, this whole time he's been talking on his tapes to Diane, who's you know been ambiguous... And it is Laura Dern. If we are going to have a Diane, then I like that it is Laura Dern. And she's kind of been with Kyle MacLachlan on all these mysteries he's been investigating to some degree. It's a unifying sort of thing to the David Lynch mythos, so to speak. And I like that a lot. Now, someone like you who hasn't seen Blue Velvet, uh, who doesn't really know, care much for Laura Dern, I can understand why that wouldn't. But for me, it it worked a lot. Uh, it really got to me. I, I loved that. It's not, not that... like in a, oh, go in ahead. a teary way. Not in a teary way. But I got chills, and I had a huge smile on my face. So I like that a lot. It's not that I don't like her. It's that the only thing I've seen her in is the Jurassic Park movies. And I literally, the last time I saw the first Jurassic Park movie, I think I was in ninth grade. So, like, wow. yeah, it's it's just, you know, I, I she's completely out of my circle of things that I'm interested in. Like, it's not that I think she's a bad actress. It's not that I actually dislike her. It's that this is the first thing I've seen her in in forever. And so I just kind of nothinged it. Like, uh, uh, really, the only thing I dislike is that they are making Diane an actual character who's going to be doing stuff. Uh, I never really wanted to see that. I understand that, um, but I do like it because I'm really interested to see where this goes. But also, there's a deleted scene from Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me that I had seen. Now, I'm not trying to say this practice is canon. I'm just saying this was something they shot and considered putting in a final product. So in Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, we are introduced to Agent Cooper in a very matter-of-fact sort of way. It is a cuts to Philadelphia, and it's a wide shot of the FBI offices, and he just sort of walks in. And then he says, Gordon, it is 10-10 on this day. I'm worried about it because of a dream I told you about. And he just sort of says that. Um, in, there's a scene that I assume was supposed to introduce him where he just kind of pops up from below the frame and is doing like these weird exercise in his like work clothes on a door frame. And he's talking to something on the other side of the door. And he's ta- it sounds like he's talking to Diane, like it's her office in the next room, but it feels so cheap because you know, nobody's in the other room and it's just Kyle McLaughlin talking to nothing. And I'm like, we almost got that, <laughs> which I don't like. And it, I, I like Diane being an actual person. I mean, that's uh, how is that, that any different than all the thousands of times that he talked to Diane on his tape recorder in the Because show? he's talking to a tape recorder. He's yes. not actually talking face-to-face with somebody. And so when he's talking, I don't know, it feels like a weird Hanna-Barbera cartoon where they, were too, like, they couldn't afford to animate another person, so they just talk to somebody in the other room who isn't responding. But maybe there isn't, but he's all like, oh, Diane, he did something new with this room. Oh, it's the clock. It's moved 12 inches to the left. And he pauses. Now, I don't know if he's like that room is actually empty within the context of the film or if there is actually supposed to be someone in there that he's interacting with. It's so awkward. And that would be like stretching the tightrope way too tight for my liking because it's ambiguous, right? He's talking on a tape recorder. And uh, Diane maybe is just a code. Maybe it's an actual person. I don't know. But when it's allegedly somebody's office of Diane and we're not going to see her. It's, that's I think that is very lazy. And the whole scene itself is also really cheap. They're just on a white wall with a door. And like, this is the scene. Okay. But so I much prefer this. Um, so moving away from that, uh, I guess uh, we get a little bit more about uh, the second uh, Sheriff Truman. Uh, I like that we're getting some backstory with him, but he was in this episode for, I'm not even kidding, five seconds or less. I wish yeah. that we could focus on him a little bit. If you're going to give us this tragic backstory about him and his wife, 
do something with that. Uh, don't have him so far in the background and then give him this backstory. Uh, I'm afraid that we are not going to get to see him really flex his acting muscles here. And that kind of bothers me because I think that I could be made to like this character and enjoy him maybe as much as I did the previous Sheriff Truman, but they've got 3,000 characters that they're juggling. I don't think that they're going to get around to giving him something to do. I'm afraid it's just going to be taking more crap from his wife and he's just going to be sitting around in the background and then Chip is going to be making fun of him. I don't know if we're going to get anything more with him and that kind of bothers me because I think they could give him something really interesting if they would just do it. I think they'll get there. Um, how many how many week, episodes do you think it'll take for them to do it? I don't care. Um, I think they'll get it and it'll be fine. Um, the scene though that uh, that scene I think was more kind of supposed to introduce us not just a little some exposition on Frank Truman, but it's also supposed to give us a window on how most of the uh, police department feels about Chip. Now, here's the thing about. Uh, when I when we first met Chip and he was kind of being a, a, a jerk to Andy and everyone and Hawk and everybody about the old Laura Palmer case, I had taken that as there's a new guard at the sheriff's department and there's an old guard mm -hmm. and Chip is kind of supposed to be the stand-in of the of the newer people who just don't take it as seriously. I guess it's just him. Now, one thing we forgot to really mention is in the last episode when uh, not Matthew McConaughey is at the bar smoking and then that one guy who works at the bar says, hey, stop smoking. And then it's actually Chip who comes on over and says, I'll take care of it. And he takes the money. Okay. It I, is the same actor. I didn't, I didn't make that connection. I didn't either. I'd have somebody point it out to me. Now, you could point it out as we're taking too long for these subplots to get around anywhere. I understand that. But at the same time, it was only like – it's like a two week difference. So it's almost like just like something in the older episodes where you would watch something and then two episodes later you'd get a follow up on it. I just think this is like the first time in a long time where I'm watching Twin Peaks a week apart and I'm forgetting the details. Um, so I'm okay with that. But in that same scene where we met Chip, we also have Bobby Briggs talking about how we're trying to investigate uh, drugs coming into Twin Peaks and he's trying to figure out how they're doing it because the same drugs are killing high school students. Bobby used to be the person who was selling the drugs at high school. So I guess he has a bit of a personal connection to try to stop this. And I guess it is Chip who is the connection inside the, P uh, the sheriff's department who is kind of getting this by. And I guess this Matthew McConaughey looking character is, you know, the person who's been selling it in Twin Peaks. And he's getting a supply from this guy who looks a lot like Bruce Campbell with silver hair. Um, and so it, that's what I'm reading. Is and that... it's possible it's possible that Shelly, uh, Shelly's daughter and her boyfriend maybe are involved somehow. They uh, they had cocaine last episode, so it's possible that they are somehow involved with it. Well, yeah, they're the result of it. I'm seeing them as like they're, they're the ones being affected by this whole thing. It's a very interesting thread that is now connected over three episodes. So I think we're getting more traction on this than I think – I don't know. I haven't heard you say anything particularly about this subplot, but I think we're getting more traction on it than I've been giving it credit for. Maybe you've been giving it credit for. Uh, so I, I want to go back and rewatch all six of these episodes in one – uh, sitting in one go, just you know, crank out the the tea or the coffee or what have you, probably coffee for Twin Peaks, and just power through six episodes. So, I like this a lot. And also at the Roadhouse, that Patrick Swayze looking guy with this, I'm not Patrick Swayze, that uh, that Bruce Campbell looking guy with the silver hair, he like waved. He's the one who waved at Shelley. Oh, and okay. she just sort of gave him the cold shoulder and was like, oh, whatever. Look at James is looking at you, girl. And so I'm thinking, is that Amanda Seyfried's uh, dad? Uh, well, maybe that that would maybe. that'd be interesting because i knew dana ashbrook kind of got gray hair so i was like but that that doesn't look like dana ashbrook that looks you know he has silver hair but it, it, it doesn't look like him and i guess this guy's supernatural and i can i talk about this i thought i was mesmerized by the scene where he intimidates the matthew mcconaughey character um that scene i think is here's i get this indicative of pretty much how my feelings over the entire course of this uh, series because I was really kind of put off and not sure what to think when we got those first two episodes and I, I wasn't, I didn't really like it. I did not like it, but I didn't really like it. Um, so with this, uh, but, but as, as the episodes progressed, I started to feel like I was getting more on its wavelength or maybe it was coming into its own. And with this episode, it came together and I, I, I was so happy about that because uh, I, I'm with the Dougie stuff that feels almost really personal about um, David Lynch. I'll put a pin and come into that later. Uh, but um, 
for that scene though, uh, with with the guy who's t- taking the drugs and um, is talking to the weird magician guy, that scene has no music in it. It's just a lot of ambient noise, and it totally worked for me. Now I've talked about this before, where if you're having a scene where there is or like movies will make the creative choice to just go entire movies without doing any musical score, you had better have your ducks in a row because that is a creative choice that will either make or break a movie for me. Uh, if it's something like Silence, the Martin Scorsese film, they did that perfectly. But if it's something like um, Loving, the Jeff Nichols film, it completely killed any sort of momentum that movie would have ever built up. And it made that movie endlessly boring. And a lot of these earlier episodes that just don't have music, I've actually found to be more on the boring side than a strong creative choice. And that's just me. But this scene is pure visual storytelling. So the lack of music is felt, and you feel the sense of dread that the Matthew McConaughey-looking kid is feeling. Um, and that shot where he sends the dime up in the air and it's just staying in place, that looks like a special effect from the original show. I don't know what it was. It, it looked so classic Lynch, and I really enjoyed that scene a lot. And uh, maybe I'm talking too much about it, but I, I really enjoyed that part. What did you think of that scene? Um, it's another thing where I, I don't feel like I have a good enough handle on any of these characters to make a judgment. Uh, and I know you're probably going to get tired of hearing me say that, but like, I don't know this guy. I guess he's supposed to be important because you said you know his name. Uh, but I don't know him. I had actually completely forgotten that he was the guy in the Roadhouse last week. And that's more the fault of we're watching these one week apart. But, you know, we were doing that when we were recording for the old show. So, like, I'm not sure if that's it. I think it's just that there's so many characters and I'm having trouble keeping up with all of them. You know, when we were doing podcast episodes on season two, there would be less than 20 characters that you had to keep up with. Now there's a whole bunch more. And so, like... I saw someone on Twitter the other day saying that it was really distracting seeing Tom Sizemore in Twin Peaks. So I open up another tab, and I Google Tom Sizemore, and I'm looking at that guy's face, and I'm thinking, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know who he is in Twin Peaks. Like, it's not that we're waiting a week in between each episode. It's that there's so many characters that I'm having to keep up with, and I just can't do it. Uh, Now, if I was to watch all of this in the span of two weeks, you know, one episode a day, something like that, it would be a lot easier for me to say, oh, okay, that's Chip, he was in the the Roadhouse, and oh, okay, this is that guy who looks like Matthew McConaughey, he was in the Roadhouse, and now he's here. But, like, right now, because there's so many different things we're having to keep up with, it's hard for me to get a grip on what's going on. Um, All I knew was, okay, like, for a second, until you said that this was the guy in the Roadhouse who was uh, harassing that one girl, I thought this was a brand new character. I thought it was yet another character they were introducing, and now it's coming together a little bit for me now, uh, but I still think that they could have done something a little bit better to make it not be so overwhelming for people like me who are having trouble keeping up with it all. Now, to play devil's advocate, I think that's kind of the point. Now, I remember when I first watched Twin Peaks, I was overwhelmed by the number of characters from the pilot episode. Oh, yeah, definitely um, in the pilot. It, it it starts off with a bunch of characters in the show, but then they don't add 300 more characters throughout the season. They stick with those characters and by the time you get to you know the third or fourth episode, you know who all these characters are and what their relationship with is each other, with each other. Well, yeah, yeah, but I think like I mean when I was watching for the first time, I got Ray Wise and Richard Bamer mixed up. They're both men in their forties who, or later thirties, earlier forties, who have brown hair with a little bit of gray in it, maybe sprinkled in there, and they both wear suits, and they both you know we were both introduced to them in the same scene where they're working at the Great Northern. And I kept forgetting which one was Laura's father and which one was Audrey's father. Um, and then eventually, you know, over time, I kind of got it because Leland's hair turned white. But, you know, watching this with my little brother for the first time, it's probably overwhelming for him, too. Uh, trying to remember, oh, yeah, that's Dr. Jacoby over here on the side. And, oh, yeah, that's James. He's so bland, I forgot about him. And, you know what I mean? Like, there's there's just so much. And, you know, since Kyle MacLachlan is so charismatic and that character jumps off the screen immediately... Uh, Outside of the stuff going on at the sheriff's department, you might forget a lot of those side characters. Like, oh yeah, Piper Laurie, she's in this show. Um, but here, I, I think I don't know. I don't know if it's the same thing. I maybe well, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's the same thing. I'm saying it's a similar thing. He's similarly trying to overwhelm you deliberately. Um, it, it may be the same scenario, but 
it didn't do that to me when I was watching the first two seasons, and it is doing it to me now. That's why I'm just so cold on this season. Um, I, I think I agree that season one starts off with a whole bunch of characters. You've got all these characters, and they're all sleeping around and cheating on each other, and there's a whole lot of backstabbing going on. You've got characters smuggling drugs. It's a lot to take in in a two-hour pilot. But then after, like, like I said, three or four episodes in, I feel like it's a lot easier to take it in. Whereas here, you know, we're paralleling these seasons here. We're three or four episodes, actually we're six episodes in, and I'm still having trouble keeping up with it all. And even if it is a deliberate choice, I don't think that that's necessarily a smart choice. Maybe everyone else is, it's easier for everyone else than it is for me, but that's why I'm having trouble with it. Okay, now, when you watch the original series for the first time, how did you watch it? Did you watch, like, one episode a day sort of thing? Uh, no, I, uh, when I, well, when I watched season one, I watched, I think, up to episode four, and then I stopped, and I didn't watch it again for a while, and then I went back and watched it with my parents, and then it was probably, like, two episodes a day, something like that. We were watching one or two episodes a day, um, but we weren't watching once a week. We were, we were going faster than we are now in this season, uh, mm -hmm. but it was... At the most, two episodes a day, sometimes maybe one episode a day. Um, okay. Now, that was the, your first experience with it, though. And when you, so when you talk about us, you know, reviewing the first, the original series week by week, um, and how, you know, it might be the same thing here, I, I got to disagree with you there, because this is your introduction to this story, and it's once a week. Okay. Uh, but the problem is, it's so jarring that I'm not going to have a second introduction. Like, you were saying you want to sit down and rewatch all six of these episodes. I'm just having such a disappointing time watching it that I would never, I could never see myself going back and watching the season. So even if it's easier a second time, it's not going to be for me. Maybe for other people. That's understandable too. That's you know that's uh, that's up to you. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, uh, but here's the thing: like a lot of this reminds me of my first exposure to Blade Runner. Okay. Where when I, I watched that. I had never seen that movie, and I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to watch it. First time I'm going to watch it, I'm going to watch it in the theater. And it was the final cut. So a lot of details and nuances on that the world are in the final cut, but you, you just don't notice them because it's so overwhelming. And that film, to a large degree, is rather impenetrable. Uh, and so I watched that first for the first time, and I just didn't get it. I, I knew from a filmmaking level it was great, and I was intrigued, but I was – so baffled by it and largely confused by a lot of the details in the middle that I, I kind of shrugged my shoulders. And because I was, you know, writing an essay uh, on that uh, movie, I had to go back and rewatch it. And through rewatching it, I learned to appreciate it more. Now I love that movie. It's one of my favorite movies. Uh, and I think I'm going to have a similar reaction with this, where uh, this will have a great rewatchability factor for me, uh, where I'll, pay more attention to certain subplots and I'll notice things in certain subplots and how they relate to other subplots and how this is a lot more connected and cohe coherent and cohesive than I am initially giving it credit for. So I think that's what's going to happen to me. So I don't know if it'll happen to you. Uh, you said you don't, you don't have the motivation to maybe go back and watch it. I'm starting to gain that motivation and especially with this episode. And I think that's just, you know, this one of those things that's very different between me and you because you're currently rewatching the original series with your younger brother. This is, correct me if I'm wrong, your third time watching the show, right? Yep. So, like, for me, I've watched it through completely one time. And for you, you're on your third time watching the original series. And I think you're much more of a fan of the original series. I think for me, at its best, it was good, but I was never just head over heels in love with it. And there was a whole lot that was bad about it. And for me, like, it's never been this show that I think was just, like, must-see TV. There was some of it that was good, but I never was just, like, this is the best thing that I've ever seen in my life. Whereas I think you have always been much more on this wavelength, and you've enjoyed it a lot more than I have, even, you know, from the beginning all the way up to now. Yeah, if I had to rank my favorite television shows, my number one uh, TV show is The Twilight Zone, the original series. Um, but number two is Twin Peaks. And mm -hmm. there's a lot wrong with it. I know the, that eight episode stretch after the whole resolution of the Laura Palmer case is a rough eight episodes to get through. But those last five episodes, four of those last five episodes are great. And the payoff and the goodness in that show for me, anyways, far outweighs the bad. And there's stuff I don't like about it. James and Donna suck, especially in early season two when, when Donna says, I'm trembling, James. You made me. Like, what does that even mean? I don't know. 
but there's a lot wrong with it. But the effect it's had on me and the way I process television, the way I look at television and the way I might want to make films is, you know, because I, I make short films with my brother and I want to make movies as a living. And that's had such an impact on me, just at least from a from a storytelling aspect. And it's up there. And I understand there's a lot wrong with it, but I, I do love that show. And I think and I think it's must see at least in like a historical context because it's the common ant like if we're gonna go with Dar- darwinism it's it's the common ancestor of lost and the x-files and desperate housewives and 13 reasons why and pretty little liars and stranger things and like all these things you wouldn't think of veronica Mars. it was like so many things you wouldn't even think would ever be connected this is like the common ancestor so i think from a historical point of view it is important and i do think it's musty from that regard um speaking of james do you think we're ever going to see him again in the show yeah he's bald in the entertainment weekly covers yeah, and he wasn't bald in the first episode, was he? Right. Okay. Um, we don't get any... Oh, this is the first episode in a while where we haven't gotten anything from uh, uh, Philip Jeffries. No no reference to him in this episode. Right. Um, I'm trying to think if anything else that needs to be discussed. Um, are you enjoying the Dougie subplot? Because like, when I was watching this episode, it made me think of the uh, Ben Horn Civil War fever dream and like... I know that you are a bigger you, – you like Kyle McLaughlin as an actor, but, like, to me, this kind of reminds me of how in season two, I feel like a big reason they had Ben Horn going through his Civil War thing, and they had James and the Cougar Lady, and then they had Nadine as an 18-year-old throughout, like, the entire second season. I feel like a big reason they did all of that was to kind of – not necessarily padding, but, like, all of these other subplots are moving along at a normal pace, but we have to keep this one treading water, so let's – throw James out of town for a few episodes and let's create this new subplot and let's have Ben Horn lose his mind and then we'll have him get back to normal so that he can interact with this other subplot that's moving at this pace. I feel like they're doing that here where we're getting a little bit of momentum with all these other subplots in this season, but we have to keep Agent Cooper, the real Agent Cooper who's now taking the place of uh, Dougie, we have to keep him kind of uh, in a childlike state so that when we are ready for him to interact with these other subplots, these other subplots will be at the point that we are ready for them to be at when he interacts with them. I feel like that's what they're doing because we're now on the sixth episode, and personally, I don't feel like a whole lot has happened with them. Uh, she's paid off the people he owed money to, but like, I'm seeing him do a lot of the same stuff each episode. Like, he doesn't know how to walk up the stairs. Like, he's just staring at the stairs, and she's like yelling at him to go up the stairs and stuff like that. And I feel like that's why they're doing this because. Um, Whenever we saw that he took he switched places with Dougie, uh, this was like in episode three, I think. Um, way way back when we saw that happen, I thought, okay, now he's gonna be kicking butt and taking names, and that's not what happened. He went to this childlike state, and I feel like that's why they're doing it like this. Yeah. Um. This Dougie subplot was a lot less funny to me this episode, and mm-hmm. not in a bad way. Um. You're right. We're seeing him do a lot of the same things now because he's now kind of gone through a cycle in the Dougie. And he's the first time going through that cycle, it's I found it humorous. Like it was this ridiculous shaggy dog joke that I couldn't stop laughing at because I remember watching with my brother and the part where he's playing the slot machines. He goes to one slot machine and you're sitting there intently watching your screen like what's going to happen. And then he does it. And then he walks to another slot machine and he pulls the arm and he gets another jackpot. And then I was like, that was just the same thing as the first time. And then he goes to another, he's like walking to another slot machine. And I'm thinking, oh, he's just going to keep playing slot machines forever. And he did. And so I kind of got onto the joke relatively early on. And I found it funnier and funnier every time he pulled another slot machine. And we're just dragging it out longer and longer. I found that humorous. And uh, him interacting with all of his coworkers for the first time, I found humorous. But while we also got a little slight progression with him saying that Tom Sizemore was lying. Mm-hmm. Um this time around, though, we're seeing him kind of go through the same things, and I would be remi- I, I would. I don't want to take credit for this next thing I'm going to say, because I think because I heard it from another from a critic, and he said that uh, the Dougie stuff he doesn't find funny at all. He actually finds it very sad, and in a compelling way, because um, that first show was all about how everybody was stuck in their own world and worried about their own universe and nobody noticed Laura calling for help Mm -hmm. and everything she did was a call for help and nobody cared because they were all too caught up in their own lives. And to a large degree, that's sort of what's happening with Dougie here 
where he is catatonic. There's clearly something wrong with this person. But everybody's just too kind of caught up in their own lifestyle, in their own world, to notice that something is clearly wrong with this person. And I guess something's clearly been wrong with Dougie for a while because everyone just sort of seems like, yeah, this is kind of Dougie. Yeah. Nobody's seeking help until this episode. Nobody's, and, and so it's, it's, it's sort of alarming once you start to think about it. And it started to be sad to me in this episode um, because uh, there is, there's that one scene where he's having coffee, I think in the fourth episode and it's in the morning and he's got the tie on his head and it's playing this wacky jazz music that's all kind of upbeat and humorous. And this time he's just sitting back and drawing on case files. And it's this, it's, I, to my knowledge, new music from Angelo Badalamenti. And it's, and it's really moody and kind of sad to me. And that scene of where he's sort of scribbling, it, it started to make me think more about Dougie Jones. And I'll get into it a little bit later after you're going to make your point that you're just about to make. But um, it started to feel like it was coming more from a personal place. Uh, on the creator's decisions um, than it was initially letting on. What were you saying? Um, yeah, so when we saw Dougie, before Cooper switched places with him, we only got to see him for, you know, 10 seconds. He was talking to Jade, and she said something about your arm, it's acting weird, and he said, yeah, it's just kind of falling asleep. And then he switches places with Cooper. So we know that he was at least capable of having conversation with people. So yeah. it is still a little strange to me that his wife doesn't seem to realize that something is wrong, that his boss and all of his coworkers don't really seem to think that anything's wrong. It is a little strange to me because we very briefly saw Dougie, and we know that he was much more more competent at daily tasks than this version of Dougie. Um, having having said that, like what you said about uh, Cooper, um, you know, everyone uh, ignoring uh, Laura's cries for help and all that, do you think that this version of Cooper is going to come back and, you know, help save the day and all that? Because I've just been assuming that he would come back and he would be the same old Cooper that we had 25 years ago and he would go to Twin Peaks and he would hug Andy and he would hug Hawk and, and then he would, you know... Uh, punch the punch Bob in the face and save the day. I've been assuming that that's been what's going to happen, but now that you've mentioned that, do you think that's going to happen or do you think that something else is going to happen? We're going to get a tragic end with this character. I can honestly believe it going both ways. Mm -hmm. I think in one reality... Okay, here's my prediction. I think that... So, all this stuff with the, the person in the uh, Las Vegas uh, office space... Yeah who had the green square appear on his, that same person said, don't let anybody like this person in your life. He's talking about evil Cooper because what's, what's going to happen is evil Cooper, uh, got, he got those, he put those files in there that was like, okay, you need to kill these people because I manufactured Dougie. Because remember he said, uh, the one our man told Dougie you were manufactured for a purpose and it has been fulfilled. He manufactured Dougie so that, uh, uh, Cooper would not, I oh man okay backtracking even more but you know how when Cooper was in the floating prism in space mm -hmm. and there was the woman with her eyes stone shut and it was like really scary yeah I think if he left through the fifteen he would be in evil Cooper's body hmm. okay so he gets up and leaves they flip a switch he goes down he goes into the three and he comes out of Dougie's body or he replaces Dougie I think that. Um, all the resistance that Evil Coop is giving when he's inside of the crashed Lincoln, and he tries to go into, he tries to approach the 15 in that first place, and it's giving him a lot of resistance. And then there's a thumping on the door, and the person in that space is like, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, come up here, follow me. So he, he replaced Dougie by going into the three. That's my assumption. Now, Evil Coop knew that he would either replace himself or Dougie. So he set up this people, this person in Las Vegas who had a file to kill Dougie Jones, who he manufactured because he knew at a certain point Cooper would come through and now he's going to kill the real Cooper. Okay. Um... And he's, and then that, and that person in the, what's his place, uh, Las Vegas is using the guy with the ice pick to going to kill him. Now, what does it, now what does evil Cooper have to do with what's going down in Buenos Aires? I don't know. Um, are you uh, are you like making a connection yourself between the guy in Las Vegas and the guy with the ice pick? Because I I didn't see anything there that would connect those two. Or were you just like making a connection yourself? Um, I'm drawing the connection because that envelope that's on his desk slides under the ice pick guy's door, oh, and okay. he opens up, and there's two pictures. 
that makes sense. I didn't realize it was the same envelope. Um, I didn't actually, until now, I didn't understand what the point of showing the Las Vegas guy was. Because uh, way back when he appeared, it, it was either in the first two episodes or the second two episodes, and he was telling Danny Rand, don't ever let anyone like that into your life. I was thinking maybe it was going to be Evil Cooper, and then Evil Cooper, of course, is arrested, and I was thinking that Dougie was going to, you know, haplessly walk into that guy's office and there'd be hilarity because there's a misunderstanding and he thinks it's Evil Cooper or something like that. I was thinking it was going to be something like that, but I was kind of thinking that Evil Cooper was pulling that guy's strings. Um, so what you said makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and because that envelope has like a, a square on it. Yeah. It's a printed square, so it's like black, but I noticed that detail. And so I, that when it slid under the door. Now, so moving forward, what I think is going to happen is the ice pig guy is going to come to uh, kill our uh, the the normal Cooper and Dougie Jones's life. Yeah. Dougie Cooper. He's going to come to kill him, but uh, who, by the way, is not wearing that goofy green clothes anymore. He's wearing his classic uh, FBI uniform. But... Uh, Diane and the other FBI people are going to get there in time to maybe uh, talk with him, and Laura Dern's Diane is going to be the one to pull him out of the funk. Okay. I'd and be... then he's going to kick that little dude's out of a window or something. I don't know. Yeah, I'd be I'd be all for that. If we could get Al and Diane and uh, uh, Gordon to meet Dougie and get him back to being the normal Cooper, I'd be for that. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to put all of the money on that happening just because – so much of this season hasn't been what I thought it would be, so I'm afraid to get my hopes up for something that I want to happen. I understand. Now, I'm just going off of what we've been shown and told. I think that's what, what might happen. I think it'd be, <laughs> it'd be cool, uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to maybe bet on it, so to speak. Um, so uh, getting back to one of our plots that I feel like has been dropped, uh, do you think we're going to get anything more about that glass box that those two – uh, younger people uh, got killed in front of uh, in the first two episodes? Um, I don't know. I think its purpose is done mm. because it was a catalyst to yeah. get um, Gordon Cole to see Cooper's Yeah, first. To, get, to get them involved. Okay, so, well... Uh, tell me what you think of this, okay? Because what I saw somebody do was they they played footage side by side. It's where Cooper is doing stuff so you know where cooper's leaving the lodge and he's floating through space and then he shows up in the glass box and then he's floating through space again yeah okay so when he shows up in the glass box the two younger people are out of the room okay right uh yeah yeah that's right because remember there's that part where they leave the room to see if there's a security guard mm -hmm. you hear a noise outside and so somebody took and we saw that noise earlier when like they were talking outside and like something fell on the ground or something, so they played the, the footage of Cooper's journey through space and into the floating place in uh, the sky, and what's happening with those young people in the first episode side by side. See if maybe something that's happening with Cooper is hap is reflected with those two young people. Right. Um, and I can't remember what it was, but the the thing that ultimately comes out of the box to kill the two people. Their murder is, like, reflected by, like, I think the f flicking the switch okay. in space. So maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I'm i just I'm – going. it's been a couple weeks since I watched that, but I think that's what, what happened. But um, I think that maybe that thing was following Cooper maybe. That makes sense, yeah. Um, especially if Evil Cooper, he's got agents on Earth, uh, going by your earlier theory. He's got agents who are trying to uh, capture and kill Dougie to prevent the real Cooper from coming back. Maybe somehow he's got agents on the other side. Uh, you know how the one-armed man and the plant with the alien head, they are kind of on our Cooper's side. Maybe there's other entities on the other side who are working with evil Cooper. Yeah, and maybe it's the arms doppelganger who's sending this thing after them. Could be, yeah. Because um, remember, that was like a Wario-colored uh, arm, like tree with floating brain mm -hmm. head on it. Uh, so... Oh, sorry, you're going to say something? Um, I do hope that they bring back that glass box subplot just because I'd like to know who hires this guy to just watch a glass box all day. I was really thinking that was going to end up being really important, and so far that hasn't come back other than getting Cole into this case. Um, I'd really like to know like what company that was, who's involved with that company. Uh, I'd like to know where those security guards were because you know, we had theorized that maybe 
uh, those security guards deliberately left their posts so that the girl would go in the room and then maybe they would release the demon, which was probably like a goal that the company had. Like I, that was something that I had thought maybe was possible. Uh, so I'd like for them to bring that back as more than just a means to an end. Yeah, uh, I would too. Uh, but I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they just kind of, it was just there as a catalyst, but I, I would like to see it mm -hmm. as a, it does come back to it. Uh, one thing though is that that monster that comes out of the the glass box and kills them. It makes these weird like cutting sounds, mm -hmm. and those same cutting sounds are made by the woman with her eyes closed when she's like, "Don't go in there," and she's like, moving her hand across her neck. Do you think she's the monster? Maybe I don't know. Maybe she's a part of the monster. Like, if if we're going by my theory that if he went out of the socket in that room, he would show up at Evil Cooper's. Like, this might be Evil Cooper's mind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And it's a weird, scary, dangerous place. And the cutting sound is reflected by the, the monster that comes out of the box. Is that, are these two people agents of Evil Cooper? I don't know. Uh, it's an interesting theory, though. So, uh, I don't have anything else to say, but do you have anything to say? I don't want to cut you yeah. off. Yeah. Okay. No, um, the one thing that I've been kind of alluding to this whole time is how I feel like the there's a personal element from Lynch that's involved here. Mm -hmm. it's, it comes from the stuff with Dougie, and... A lot of the stuff with Dougie feel, is starting to feel to me like David Lynch trying to – it's sort of reflecting David Lynch's process of how do I get back into the swing of things? How do I get back to filmmaking after being away from it for so long? Because um, uh, Dougie looks up at the poster, and that catches his eye. And, it, and it's, a, it's a poster for something, but it's also a piece of art, right? Mm -hmm. It's a piece of graphic design art. And he's starting to emulate it. That really catches his eye. Um, and – He's looking down at these pictures, and he's just kind of going off of instinct because he sees these dots appearing, so he's just kind of going for it, and he's, and he's trying something. So I feel like a lot of this is, like, David Lynch doesn't feel like he's David Lynch anymore. The same way Cooper doesn't feel like he's Cooper anymore. He's, like, kind of living a different life at this point because he, it's been ten, over 10 years since he made Inland Empire. So now, so this is just I sort of see as him working out the process and the feeling of getting back into something that you've been away from for so long. And that's what I got from it. Do you think that theme works in Twin Peaks? I think it works for this. Okay. Because the thing is, David Lynch, like, there's, like, Phase 1 Lynch, and there's, like, Phase 2 Lynch. Um, I think Phase 1 Lynch ends with Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. Okay. Because um, when that happened, there's a huge uproar against that movie, and everyone hated it. And it took him five years to make another movie. And that was, of course, uh, Lost Highway, which a lot of people see as a response to the reaction that movie got. It's a much, I, from what I hear, it's a much more angry movie. And people were like, you know, this, the, the fire walk is incoherent, it's lame, and whatever. And so instead of making something that was more uh, digestible, he made something that was even crazier. And then he made The Straight Story, which... I guess is a much more digestible movie. But then he made Mulholland Drive and Inland Empire, which are absolutely insane. I've never seen these. These are the three movies of his that I haven't seen, which are The Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, and Inland Empire. But from what I understand, he became a different artist after Fire Walk With Me kind of went up in flames, so to speak. Um, so a lot of that was in his response to the way people sort of embraced Twin Peaks for all of six months and then hated it a year later. And so a lot of this does feel like the post Twin Peaks Lynch coming back to Twin Peaks. And I think that it works for the story this is telling and how it, in a thematic level, somewhat ties back to the first one um, and how he's trying to remember, like, Dougie Jones is Cooper, but he's trying to remember where he came from. Maybe he's not remembering where he came from, but we know that he has something that he has to go back to. And maybe this is Lynch having to go back to Twin Peaks. So that's what, that's, <laughs> what my theory is. This whole eight-episode prologue to the last ten episodes is getting back to what Twin Peaks was, and at the same time, the characters are going to converge upon the show, the, the town of Twin Peaks. And I'm still hoping that will happen. I, I think I'll be singing a very different tune if that does happen. Um, talking about how you think this may be a representation of Lynch, uh, like you know, getting back into the swing of things, it kind of reminds me of in comic books. Um, Specifically, Frank Miller and Alan Moore. Uh, I don't think they've ever worked together on anything, but uh, you hear a lot of people talk about like early Frank Miller versus like later Frank Miller. And like, if you read Batman Year One and Dark Knight Returns, both of those came out like within a year of each other. But then you look at like The Dark Knight Strikes Again, which came back out. It came out like early 2000. So it's like 
a good 15 years after The Dark Knight Returns, and it's very different tonally, and, like, the subject matter is very different. Like, it's a very different story, and it's from a very different kind of creator. And uh, I've heard different people theorize on, you know, why is this that his, you know, approach was so different? And, like, you look at some of Frank Miller's other works, and pretty much everything after Dark Knight Returns is kind of, it's kind of like what you were saying. Like, you have Phase 1 Frank Miller, which is, like, everything up until Dark Knight Returns, and then Phase 2 is everything after. Um, and it's kind of like that. And um, a lot of people are always disappointed. Um, like, you know, they want the Phase 1 Frank Miller. They want that kind of thing. But, like, storytelling is very different now, and the world is very different now. A lot of artists, whether they're comic book creators or movie makers, they are responding to their experiences in the world. And so the world is a very different place in 2017 than it was in 1990. Um, you know, a lot of things have happened since then that are, you know, made the world better. A lot of things have happened that have made the world worse. And so uh, it's very possible that David Lynch is making a different show because he is having a different experience in life now than he was 25, 26 years ago. Um, and in which case, you know, you can't really blame him for that. Um, and, you know, I, I talked about uh, on my own channel, I did videos on the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen graphic novels a few weeks ago. And uh, in those books, uh, the first few books are basically just... Uh, literary characters crossing over with each other and having adventures, and that was what I really liked about the series. And then you get into the Black Dossier, and there's a little bit of that, but then it becomes this whole huge uh, pulpit statement that Alan Moore is trying to make about how pretty much all fiction of the 20th century is garbage, and everything from before he was born was awesome. And it kind of reminds me of that, too, like what you were saying about how David Lynch is making a statement uh, using these characters. And I was curious if you thought it worked, because for me, generally... I'm less forgiving about something like that if you start off doing a show and then – or like in the case of The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, you do a couple of storylines, 12 issues, and then like 10 years later you do another standalone graphic novel, but you're suddenly inserting your own little preachy message into it. Usually I'm not okay with that, but in this case I think even though I'm not really digging this season, I think I am okay with Lynch trying to say something like that. Yeah. Um, there is one complaint I still have. Okay. Um and it's more apparent here than in any other Lynch movie I've seen uh, where the bad guys here are so evil. There's no sense of any kind of humanity. Like Chip is so, I don't, I don't want to say comically evil because that sends the wrong message. He, he, I don't, I don't see him in Batman 66, No, but um, he's so remorseless and uh, he seems almost inhumanly insensitive. Yeah. And it's just supposed to be like, oh, I'm not supposed to like him, but do we really need him to be that, like, cartoonishly unlikable and uh, irredeemable? And the same thing with this Matthew McConaughey-looking character. Uh, he runs over a kid and is like, hey, I told him to get out of my way, right? And he's, like, justifying it to himself. And I get that he's, like, super high and angry and stuff, but there's no reaction to that. Right. And I find that a little annoying and a little bothersome. The, the character, though, who flings the dime up in the air... Uh, he reminds me a lot of the uh, the Dennis Hopper character from Blue Velvet. Okay. In the way that he almost reminds me of a grown up child, like a, like a like an immature brat in a grown up's body, and realizes that he has leverage over people and some kind of physical power because you're a grown up now. Yeah. Uh, and the way he talks, I mean, there's not nearly as much f bombs and uh, stuff as Frank Booth from Blue Velvet, but. It's a say, similar thing where he also pines after Shelley at the roadhouse, and he's, he's somewhat unrequited. Of course, in Blue Velvet, it's a slightly similar but really different uh, sort of situation. But Frank Booth, there's a woman that he pines after and wants. So, And, you know, you were saying that these villains are very villainous with no redeeming qualities at all. I hadn't noticed that. I hadn't really picked up on that, but you're definitely right. Um, Chip kind of reminds me of two characters from, I guess, phase one of David Lynch. Um, one of them is the Mountie, uh, who is trying to set up uh, Cooper. You know, he's a law enforcement agent, but he's involved in the drug industry, and he's trying to set up a good agent uh, to take the fall. Uh, I felt like Chip is kind of falling in that pattern. All we haven't seen so far is him trying to set up Hawk or something like that uh, yeah. to, for to be a fall guy. And also in Fire Walk With Me, um, there was a guy who was a deputy in Deer – is it Deer Meadow? Yeah. And the deputy in Deer Meadow, he later uh, – he gets shot by uh, Bobby and uh, when he is with Lara, um, and he was about to pull a gun on them. And so I feel like 
I don't know if this is David Lynch's like 25 year statement on like the police because we've got a lot of good people who are in the police department. You've got you know Harry and we got Hawk and Andy and Lucy. So like it's not. I don't think that Lynch is trying to say, oh, this is the police. Look at the police. They're evil. I don't think he's trying to say that um, because you've got good people and bad people in the cops uh, within the cop uh, industrial complex, whatever. I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> but, like, you know, he... The I, law enforcement military he, complex. Yeah. Law enforcement. That's what I'm trying to say. That's the word. Um, I don't know if he's trying to say anything, or if this is just, like, a similar archetype that he's using once again, and it's just coincidence. No, I do see a very similar thing, and I kind of like that if we're going to investigate a drug ring, it might, you know, one of the connections might be in the local sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. It's all the stuff surrounding that archetype that I just don't much care for. Yeah, um, and, you know, in the old show, like, you had characters like Ben Horn, he was involved in villainous stuff. Like, he wanted to burn the sawmill down, and that is straight up illegal. And he uh, was dealing with Leo, who is a hired gun, and uh, they they hired Hank to kill Leo, who is also a hired gun. And so, like, uh, th he was involved in a lot of bad stuff. He, uh, he was going to the one-eyed jacks to have sex with women who were very likely underage and one of them was and he didn't have sex with her because it was his daughter and she knew that um but like you also get to see a good side to him um he genuinely cares about his daughter and uh i feel like that is something that is missing here and i didn't notice it until you brought it up but you're right uh the bad guys here are just bad guys like we don't get to see matthew mcconaughey like calling his wife to say like hey honey I know that we're low on rent, but I'm doing something and we're going to get the rent money in time or something like that. You know, it, it wouldn't justify well, him murdering a kid. I understand kid. what you're saying, but to give a hint, he's younger than 25. Oh, oh, okay. Um, well, I, I was just saying, like, we don't get anything to, like, you know, I'm not saying there's anything to justify running over a kid, but... No, yeah, yeah. No, but we don't get anything that says, like, okay, he's doing bad stuff, but he feels like he has a reason. Uh, we don't get that with any of our villains this season so far. And there's, I think there's, like, Leo Johnson is a woman-beating, woman, woman beating, uh, drug-smuggling, uh, evil person. But there's something about Leo that's, that's different. I can't quite put my finger on it. At the um, end of season two, we start to feel bad when Wyndham Earl says, okay, if you let go of this rope, the spiders are going to come down and kill you. We start to feel bad whenever that happens. Like, even after all the stuff he's done to Shelley and every other character that he's abused, like, you still kind of feel a twinge of regret. And if Wyndham Earl suddenly showed up and tied up Matthew McConaughey or uh, silver-haired magician guy, uh, if he tied them up and said, the spiders are going to get you, I don't know if I would feel that regret. Yeah, and I'm not necessarily talking about silver-haired magician guy. I'm not talking more about Chip and Matthew McConaughey character. Right, yeah. Um, but, because, like, even then with, like, silver-haired magician guy, he has that sort of, like, pining towards Shelly that is unrequited, and he's a bad dude, but there's at least something resembling a human in there. Yeah. Um, at least the very brief glimpse we've had towards him. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly talking about Leo from, like, the first season, right? Yeah. Where he's so irredeemable. But you don't hear him, like, when he's talking to Cooper, he just sort of, like, he, his, his, the conversation goes something like, uh, hey, this is Agent Cooper. He wants to ask you some questions. And then Leo says, so ask. Mm -hmm. And then Cooper says, oh, Leo, is that short for Leonard? And then Leo says, is that a question? <laughs> and then uh, Cooper just sort of, like, laughs a little bit, like, oh, my God, I'm dealing with this person. That is the dialogue exchange. And, but, you know, the dialogue is that, Hey, stupid J. Edgar, get out of my face before I chop it. I can kill you. It's my property, douche. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't say that. And I feel like Chip would say that. <laughs> so I think that's the difference is Leo played it cool even though he was a trashy, loathsome human being. Mm -hmm. He played it cool enough. Not as cool as, like, <clears throat> Hank or Ben, but he still played it cool to some degree. You know, that, that, it just makes me miss Hank. Like, you remember the episode where it was Leland Palmer's wake and Hank was bringing Sarah the food? And, like, yeah. Hank was involved in some pretty messed up stuff, but then he had that human side. Um, you're, you're right. This is making me miss the old Twin Peaks more and more. No, uh, Yeah, so that's just, like, the, the stuff with the bad guys is really my one big criticism that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then we even get the little short guy, he just brutally kills somebody, and it's like, we don't get any other information about him. And it's like, he, okay. He likes his ice pick. He seems sad yeah. to see it bent. His theme song is some pretty bumping hip-hop music, that's uh -huh. for sure. Uh, so, yeah. I for, a, for a hot second, I thought that that was Mini-Me from the Austin Powers movies. Um, like, <laughs> I agree. Because you, you don't get a good look at him. And I was dead certain. I was like, that's got to be him. I even looked him up, and it's like, no, that's not him. It's some other guy. But I, I thought it was him. 
So, okay, now, without being insensitive towards any any person, so usually short people, like this person, this, ah, okay, this, this actor just kind of strikes me as somebody who's just really short, as opposed to somebody like a, like a dwarf where there's some kind of birth defect, mm-hmm. um, where in that regard, like, uh, heads are generally pretty large in comparison to their body, in comparison to their legs. Right. There's there's different, uh, I don't know what to call it, it's a disorder of some kind, you know, there's dwarfism, and then there's something else that's along those same lines, but it's not exactly the same thing, and uh, you're right, this guy, I think, when I looked up a picture of him on Internet Movie Database, uh, he didn't look nearly as much like Vern Troyer as I thought he did, uh, mm-hmm. but just in this show, like, we see him quickly running into a room with an ice pick in his hand, and then he runs again, and, like, we don't get a second to just take a look at him. Uh, so I was thinking, watching the show, I was like, that looks like the guy who played Mini-Me, but then after looking at him again, it's like, oh, wait, no, that's not him. He does kind of look like him. Mm-hmm. You are right. I was just, like, it was just a question that went through my mind is, I wonder what uh, the story with his actor, because um, we didn't get a good look at him, but he looks more, and this is going to sound really me, I don't want to do anatomically correct than, mm. you know, uh, another, and I don't mean... Right, oh, man. right. I'm already in a grave. I'm sorry, everybody. But um, I've already dug my hole. So anyway, that's just a thought that went through my head. Do you have a favorite line from this? Because I do. Uh, maybe Hen- Henry Dan... Oh, wow. Henry Dean Stanton's line of I've smoked every day for 75 years. Or He says he probably throws in a swear word or two in there, but I like that line. It, it really says a lot about his character, who I feel like maybe I'm bringing Fire Walk with me into this episode, but we did know a little bit about him, but I think that tells us just what we need to know, even if you haven't seen Fire Walk with me. Yeah, and I think you should bring Fire Walk with me into this. We have the ring. We have references to Philip Jeffries. I think yeah, that's fine. Definitely. Um, but yeah, you are right. It does speak volumes about him where he feels invincible, right? Uh-huh. He's so old and just so kind of done with life, but he just can't die. He's smoked every day for seventy five years, and then he and... and then he sees a kid die, and he's thinking like, you know, I've been smoking for you know like three fourths of my life, and I'm still here, but this kid who's you know not even ten yet, he's dead. Like you know, it's it just adds mm-hmm. to tragic. Uh, can I guess what your line is? Yeah. So Hawk is in the bathroom, and Chip walks in and says, like, what, what's going on? And, and Hawk says, use the women's bathroom, Chip. And Chip is like, I'm going to tell the sheriff on you. And he's like, okay, Chip, get out of here, Chip. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I, but he, he honestly, he did say, like, use the women's bathroom. And I, I was thinking yeah. maybe that was your line. Uh, it's not my favorite line, but it is my God bless you, Hawk moment of the week. <laughs> yes, God bless you, Hawk. You tell that loathsome pile of filth, Chip, who's boss. You tell him to go use the women's restroom. Uh, that might not actually be a good idea. But, yeah, you tell him. <laughs> you tell him, Hawk. You're the man. If he, if that, if that woman who is telling Chip, uh, you know, hey, their son committed suicide, if she walks in and finds Chip in there, she'll, uh, she'll beat him up. I, I think she can handle herself. Yeah, uh, that that dispatcher, she reminds me of the person in South Dakota who's the morgue or like the who's doing the autopsy on the John Doe. Oh yeah, and you know we didn't get any of that uh, in this episode with uh, the cop from Dark Knight Rises. We didn't get any of that. I was kind of sad. Yeah, me too. Uh, that was, uh, that was like, the one subplot that I, I still want to see just an ongoing show with those guys in South Dakota. Yeah, I do, too. Uh, we haven't gotten any Matthew Lillard. Um, I know, and I don't yeah. think we're going to. I'm, I'm more and more, I think, that we're done with him, unfortunately. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I, like, I, like, I like Matthew Lillard. Uh, yeah. I like him giving, like, a straight-up dramatic performance, and I think he's really good. <laughs> so, I've got to say, we might not get any more of him. Uh, what was but, your favorite line, though? It is... Albert Rosenfield, when he gets out of the car and is in the rain and he has his umbrella and he's just so frustrated, he says, F you, Gene Kelly, mother effer. <laughs> <laughs> Albert My is good. And I, me, and, me and Spencer laughed so hard at that line. Oh, yeah. Uh, because we have a, it kind of looked like Portland, the architecture did. Uh, there's trees kind of uh, in the roads and everything. It kind of looks like Portland, Oregon to me. And it's raining. So that is a huge tell that it might be Portland. It always rains in Portland. Um, what, what if in Twin Peaks Season 3 we get yet a third Dale Cooper lookalike and it is the mayor from Portlandia? Oh my goodness. I would freak. <laughs> or like, <you laughs> Wouldn't it be great if, yeah, if yeah, Albert and Diane are walking through Portland and they just pass by Kyle MacLachlan? <laughs> He's like, like, Dale! And he goes, hi. 
<laughs> you want a bouncy ball to bounce on? <laughs> right. He says, like, I'm looking for a lost dog right now. I, I've got to go. Um, uh, that's, the, that's like the only thing I know about Portlandia. Um, so I guess that's about all that we had to say. Um, I, I did like this episode more than the previous episode. Um, I, if anything, just the Harry Dean Stanton, uh, I think I may have called him Henry Dean Stanton. I'm sorry. Uh, the Harry Dean Stanton scene earlier really made it for me. Um, but I think as things start to slowly come together, I'm going to like it more and more, but it is taking a lot longer than I would have preferred. Um, but, uh, I like it more than I did the last couple of episodes, I think. Um, and this is my favorite episode so far, uh, I think this might be, is this, I, I want to say this is your favorite episode of the show as well, because I feel like every week you say you like this episode more than the last episode. Mm, um, I, this is probably my favorite of this, uh, of this season. Uh, there may have been other scenes that I liked more, but overall, I guess I like this episode more. Okay, that's cool. Um, and then, you know, my brother Spencer, when we finished watching the two-part premiere, he said, I didn't like that, like, at all. Uh -huh. And then after we watched this episode, Spencer said that was, like, an almost perfect episode. So uh, my brother's come, been kind of coming around on it, and uh, I, I feel like I've – not only have I gotten on its wavelength, but I think it's coming to its own at the same time. Like, we've met in the middle. Uh, we both made sacrifices for this relationship, and I think that it's really growing stronger now. Um, so, yeah, I, I like this. Yeah, so um... – I guess we will be back next week. Let's see. So we've got two more episodes, and then there's a little bit of a hiatus, right? Yes. Okay. So we will be back next week to talk about another episode of Twin Peaks The Return. In the meantime, I am the Comics Kid 2099. And I am Connor Nielsen. And we will see you guys later.